Hello, welcome back to April Space 13.82, The Voids. We are back. God damn. Arc 13 is the arc that just keeps on giving. <laughs> will you remember it fondly when it ends? Probably. Or will you despise it? It's crazy to me thinking about, in the time since we've had, like, the Mariloco fight has been, like, an entire other arc's worth of content. <laughs> it's it baffling content? to me. Yeah, I think everyone loves 13. I don't think anyone's been, like, anti-13. It's just a very long arc that could arguably be several arcs. No, it can't. Mm. It has its parts. <laughs> yeah, you're so right. <laughs> Fuck me. The arc All is right. not here to just break up <laughs> chapters. It's part of the same story arc! <laughs> it's such a long one. It's simply an epic! Well, without further fucking ado, let's get reading. <clears throat> The world was white, the world was empty, the world was hostile. The second Atoy Muzazi was absorbed into Dragon Hadrian's ability, those three impressions flashed through his mind in rapid succession. That was it. He didn't have time for anything else. He didn't have time for anything else because the next thought that went through his head was, DODGE! He blasted himself upwards with thrusters, but not fast enough. A kick to the back sent him flying like a meteor, crashing into one of the countless pillars that defined this world and embedding him into the stonework. Wheezing, he felt blood dribble down his chin. This place seemed to go on forever. A pale expanse with white fog drifting endlessly, punctuated by bleached pieces of architecture slotted together like a child's toy. This was a library and a museum and a temple and a coliseum, a world of will and memory that could never exist in reality. Dragon Hadrian appeared in a flash of blue aether, standing atop a pristine archway, looking down at Muzazi with his cold, sapphire eyes. My archive... He said, spreading his arms wide. You like it? An archive. Muzazi had heard about these, a sort of mind palace that some cogitants constructed to manage and regulate their thoughts. So that was how it was. The ability Hadrian had used to make people disappear transported them directly into his mental landscape. In short, right now, a toy Muzazi was standing inside his enemy's brain. Grunting, he pulled himself out of the rubble, dropping down to the white platform below. Even just landing from so short a height was enough to send a wave of pain vibrating through his body now. No matter, he still had work to do. A toy Muzazi ignited his radiant, glaring up at the master of this domain. Are you hoping for a home field advantage? He growled. If so, you'll be sorely disappointed. Hadrian just rolled his eyes at Muzazi's resolve. You just don't get it, do you? He sighed, standing before the full moon. Let me make it clear. Muzazi adjusted his stance. This isn't a fight you can win, Hadrian finished, and the words came from behind Muzazi. Muzazi whirled around, but too late. Again, the kick slammed into him, Hadrian's leg like a tree trunk as it crashed against his stomach. No, this is like when Yuji's kicking Mahito around in the snow. <laughs> Saliva and bile spurted out of Muzazi's mouth as he was sent flying once more, limbs flailing as he sailed through the endless white. His vision faded in and out. Unconsciousness threatened to finally catch up with him. With a great effort, with a great and desperate effort, he managed to keep his mind turning, but need to stop my... Dragon Hadrian appeared in his path. Another kick and Muzazi was sent flying in another direction, like a pinball being pelted throughout the table. His leg clipped a pillar and he went spinning, fl finally crashing down onto another platform of snow-white brick. Curled up into an undignified heap, he twitched. Dragon Hadrian appeared before him. This wasn't Gemini World he was using to get around. They were already inside Hadrian's Aether. He couldn't exactly record himself again. No, it was just as Hadrian had said. They were inside his mind right now. In this space, Dragon Hadrian could move with the speed of thought. Hadrian watched silently as Muzazi slowly picked himself up, thrusters blasting down from his ankles to keep his body upright. I don't get it, the Kajitan said emotionless. Do you still think you can turn things around at this point? You can barely stand. Muzazi lunged and Hadrian appeared behind him, facing away, his arms crossed. His confidence was such that he didn't even feel the need to look at Muzazi anymore. The full moon's blood boiled. Not confidence, Muzazi told himself. Arrogance. I could keep doing this for hours, you know, Hadrian said, looking up at the starless bright sky. You, though? I'd be surprised if you lasted ten more minutes. Hell, <laughs> you should... Another swing struck empty air. Be unconscious already, I'd say. Hadrian strolled across the border of the platform, glancing at Muzazi. You're tenacious, I'll give you that. But I just don't get... Radiant Lustrous! Muzazi hurled a shining spear at Hadrian, and it struck nothing. He felt a weight from behind as the shooting star leaned against his back, the two of them facing opposite directions. Oh, they're so gay for each other. <laughs> Why? 
Dragon Heijun said. Muzasi glared at him out of the corner of his eye. What? He rasped. I guess it's hard to tell what I'm saying when I'm zipping all over the place, Dragon smirked. I said I don't get why. Why do you want to become supreme so badly? It's to fulfill your honor or whatever, right? You don't understand anything. You're right about that, Dragon mused. I really just don't get it. Why are you trying so hard for this? You're throwing away your body. I know what else you've already thrown away. Why? Why try so hard when you know you can't win? Muzazi clenched his fists. Because I need to change the shape of this world, he said. Dragon's eyes widened. Radiant to blaze! Muzazi ignited thrusters all over his body, hoping to skewer Hadrian like a pincushion without moving a muscle, but even that was too slow. Before he could so much as blink, Hadrian was floating up above again, looking down at him once more. Only this time, his expression had changed. The cold gaze was gone. The emotionless line of a mouth had twisted. Now, he looked furious. No, you've genuinely <laughs> angered him! <laughs> Phase two. <laughs> The kick came once more, as it was always going to, and Muzazi was once more unable to avoid it, as he was always going to be. He went flying away from Hadrian, limbs pushed in front of him by air pressure, the wind buffeting against his back, blue aether crackled, and like waking from a dream, a toy Muzazi was out. The infinite space of Gemini Dominion was replaced by the collapsing wreckage of the Leisure Center, falling apart even as Muzazi flew through it, still propelled by that imaginary strike. It made sense, Muzazi supposed. If that Gemini Dominion captured and recorded its target, it couldn't do so forever. Not if the target had Aether of their own to resist it with. There was a time limit. That time limit probably varied from person to person depending on their strength, but Muzazi had managed to outlast his. That had been bad, but he was still here. And that meant there was still a chance. There was still a way. There was still a hope. It was a delusion that lasted only a second. Gemini Dominion, said Dragon Adrian. The White World returned. A toy Muzazi, who had been free of this place for only a second. You know what? This is fucked up, because this kind of parallels red light, green light. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! Skidded to a halt on a new smooth white platform. There should probably be a comment after new. Or smooth. Slowly, he looked up at the floating Hadrian. The shadow of despair had already begun to drift across the full moon's face. But, he breathed, I was out. I kicked you just as the time limit ended. Hadrian glared. And so, in that fraction of a second, you went flying in a straight line for two meters. So, the next words came from behind Muzazi's head. Let's go again. No! <laughs> <laughs> we're done. What I say, we're done. Hello? Sorry, my stupid I... ass accidentally hit the pause button while we were recording. All you missed was me bemoaning uh, Muzazi's circumstances. He got sucked I got into sucked into Gemini Dominion. Dominion. <laughs> Fucked up. Anyway, <clears throat> Ruth Blaine pushed against the inevitable. The jaws of a great serpent, the size of a train, were clamped around the monarch's set, pushing it against the ruined wall and slowly, slowly squeezing. Ruth floated within the egg, sloshing around in a yolk of liquid metal, blasting the absorbed force out of the set and directly into the creature's insides. The thing was dying, to be sure, but not fast enough. Nine smiled pleasantly, holding a limp right hand out in front of him. The serpent was protruding from the white hole he called Ahura Mazda. What was this ability? Manifestation, Nain had said. But manifestation of what? Animals? No. He'd made a sword as well. Organisms in general. The sword had been flesh and bone, after all. All abilities had a logic behind them. If you understood the logic, you could understand the weaknesses it created. If you understood the weaknesses it created, you could take advantage of them. If you could take advantage of them, you could draw blood. But then again, she'd already done that, hadn't she? She'd run her claws right through Nain's chest and pierced his heart, and it had done nothing. The man in black was still standing here, walking and talking like the killing blow was inconsequential. You seem to be deep in thought there, Ruth, Nain said softly, snake still unfurling from his ability. Or perhaps you're trying to fight back? It's difficult to tell with this level of damage. At any rate, it's a matter of seconds. This creature's jaws can crush anything given time. It didn't feel like he was wrong. She could feel it gradually, slowly but true, the metal shell of the monarch set giving way. A long, thin crack was spreading over the skeletal face that looked at Nyang. Gritting her teeth, Ruth tried to tune out the sounds of creaking metal all around her. How many seconds, though, I wonder? Nyang chuckled, taking a step forward. You've already set a new record in case you're interested. <laughs> Ruth's voice oozed from the skeletal grin of the death egg. Go to hell! You'll have to go ahead and let me know how it is, Nyang said. Five more seconds, or ten, I wonder? Maybe more. 
Shall we count together, Ruth? It'll give you something to do in your... Ruth was just thinking that someone needed to shut the sky up when someone did. Sevenfold serpent, growled a deep voice. Inferno! Hmm? Nyan glanced to the right, and in the next moment he was devoured by a bright orange flame. The grip of the serpent loosened slightly as the flame scorched its back, and Ruth didn't miss her chance. Red Aether flashed as she switched the monarch set for Direwolf, dropping to the ground and darting away before the jaws could snap shut against her. Jumping from floor to wall to floor, she came to a halt a short distance down the hallway. Someone else had arrived on the other side of Nyan. The Ascendant General of the Supremacy, Alexandrius Toll, a giant of a man with short orange hair and gleaming gold eyes. There were others with him, too. Three soldiers dressed in white, their weapons pointed towards the spiraling flame before them. Even though his attack had inadvertently saved her, the Ascendant General wasn't someone Ruth particularly wanted to meet. She was a wanted criminal, after all, a survivor of Elysian Fields, along with the other charges the Shepherdess had framed her for. Without question, these people were not her allies. But... Dark Star! hissed Toll, hateful eyes fixed on the funeral pyre he was weaving. It certainly seemed that they weren't Nyane's allies, either. Along the long stretch of the ravaged hallway, two pairs of golden eyes met. No words were spoken, but intentions were communicated all the same. A recognition, a wariness, a proposal. Truce. Truce. There's a funny phenomenon I've observed, Nyane thought as the flames barreled against his shield. Let me tell you about it. Is he talking to us? He's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> he, he thinks like he's talking he to what? someone. Yeah. <laughs> he thinks like he's talking this little to someone. Freak. I hate him. Through the tiny insects he'd scattered at the start of the battle, he was able to get a sense of what was happening outside the dome he'd erected. It wasn't anything so convenient as telepathy, though. The insects outside expelled pheromones that their counterparts inside his body collected and translated back into images and sounds. It had taken a long time to design life forms capable of that. It was something he was quite proud of. Particularly because, right now, it was showing Nying that two very strong people were coming after him. On one side of the hallway, Alexandra's toll was using Sevenfold Serpent. <laughs> Inferno. Crafting his own snake out of fire that was constricting and burning Nyan's location. Isn't that a technique Cadman used? Did he get it from Toll? Uh, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Indeed, he could feel... Get out of here, Casca. He could feel the mildest hints of heat leaking through the shield. Dangerous. On the other, Ruth Blaine was preparing for the kill. Her direwolf set was pretty formidable when it came to speed. She was waiting for the moment the shield cracked open, ready to rush in and slaughter. Not a bad strategy. Against someone else, it might even have been sufficient. But Nyane was not someone else. After all, I have a snake too, remember? Nyane whistled sharply, and the massive serpent he'd constructed with Ahura Mazda responded to the pre-programmed signal. With a hiss, it slithered down the hallway, its bulk denting the walls, advancing upon Toll's little group. Pax! The Ascendant General roared. Immediately, his subordinates leapt into action. While the two in the back blasted the beast with suppressive fire, the masked man, Pax, charged forward. In one smooth motion, he leapt to the side, dodging a vicious bite, planted his feet against the wall, and kicked off again. With hands as fast as lightning, he pummeled the serpent with two strange weapons he had taken out of his pockets. At first, Nyan couldn't quite identify them. But they were, weren't they? They were stamps. How interesting this world of Aether could be. Did you steal this ability from your one-shot character? Okay. Uh, I don't believe they so. hadn't done much physical damage, but Pax seemed satisfied all the same. Flipping over the snake's back, he called out to his commander, Death mark supplied! With a wave of Toll's hand, the flame serpent attacking Nyan's shield retracted, turning its attention to the flesh and blood snake between it and its master. Opening jaws with fangs of hellfire, it lunged. I'm... <clears throat> I'm... Pa blah, 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 blah. This is Nyan, right? I'm passingly familiar with Sevenfold Serpent, both Inferno and Tsunami, but I don't see what Toll hopes to achieve here. Just from looking at my pet, he should be able to see it can withstand the kinds of temperature he can dish out. Even if he layers all seven serpents on top of each other like this, he'll barely s I assume singe those scale scales. Which means yeah. <laughs> he's got something planned. How exciting, don't you think? Let's watch. Nine had been right. The moment the flame serpent touched the flesh serpent, the temperature of the fire suddenly skyrocketed, orange tendrils turning vivid blue as they quickly ate away at the familiar's body. Within the span of a few seconds, the beast had been reduced to scorched bones, tumbling down onto the floor pathetically. Did you see it? That's an ability that boosts lethality from what I can tell. The Abrafasadian is a valuable ally. He doesn't just predict the future, but influences it as well as by, as well by establishing and encouraging a prophecy of doom. While I doubt he'll reach Abrafasad's dream of temporal enlightenment like that, it's still an effective support ability. 
Whatever the case, I'd be best served killing him first. It was odd to see an Aberfasadian, part of the UAP, working for the Ascendant General of the Supremacy. Even if he was no longer a citizen of Aberfasad, the Supremacy was no stranger to prejudice. What was surprising was that an Aberfasadian had been allowed to get so close to the Ascendant General in the first place. And that brings me to the strange phenomenon I was talking about before. Shall I tell you about it? Nain reached out and absorbed just a tiny bit of his shield back into Angra, mind you, creating a small hole he could exit through. Point one seconds, point two, point three. There! Ruth Blaine did not miss her opportunity. As Nain slipped out of the black shield, she charged in, covering the distance nearly instantly and jamming her claws into his chest. Before he could swipe at her with Angra, mind you, she whirled around, still impaling him, and slammed him into the wall. As he felt the claws sink into the wall behind him, too, Nain smiled softly. Of course, Ruth Blaine was now aware that driving her claws through his chest wasn't enough to kill him. That was why she was instead using them to restrain him, to hold him in place so that Nain's other enemy could incinerate him where he stood. In the distance, over Ruth Blaine's shoulder, Nain could see Alexandra's toll preparing his attack, seven serpents of flame coiling around each other, readying themselves to lunge forwards and embrace Nain with their heat. It was a good move. Even he couldn't survive complete incineration. That was why it was such a shame. There it is. That strange, strange phenomenon. The flames poured forth. It happens like this every time, you know? All three parties here are enemies. If anything, Ruth Blaine should hate the supremacy far more than me, and the supremacy should have greater cause to pursue Blaine than some terrorist who hasn't shown his face for decades. But that's not what happened, is it? They devoured the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. Somehow, whenever I come up against different groups like this... Ruth Blaine left away, leaving her claws embedded in Nain's chest. They know straight away that killing me is more important than anything else. His right hand twitched. Even if they're incapable of it. Ahura Mazda! Black Aether crackled around the white hole, and in the next instant, a forest of blades poured forth. They lacked detail or decoration, instead being simple and stark in their geometry. Spikes branching out from spikes, branching out from spikes, stabbing at everything within range, and they had quite the range. The flames were pushed away by the pressure. Ruth Blaine was struck in midair. The Ascendant General and his teams were taken out of sight by the wall of cruel knives. Up above, Ruth Blaine gasped, her helmet having vanished. The blade had punctured the middle of her chest, skewering her just as she'd skewered Nyane. And just like Nyane, she was still alive despite that. You've impressed me again, Ruth, Nyane said casually, pulling the claws free from his chest and tossing them onto the floor. This time you had even less time to react. You want to step forward with your armor, didn't you? Manifesting it directly around your heart to protect it against my attack? Wow, <laughs> that really is something. A centimeter of miscalculation would have meant instant death there, you know? He strode forward, and as he did, one of Toll's subordinates broke through the web of blades behind him. A woman with blonde hair tied back into a ponytail aimed twin pistols at his back. The guns seemed bulky, oddly plastic, like they were water pistols rather than actual weapons. <laughs> An armament, no doubt. Fun in the- the woman said. Ahura Mazda, Nain replied, almost bored, por pointing his right hand back at her without looking. Black Aether flashed, and a torrent of locusts were belched forth from the white hole, streaming over the woman and concealing her from sight. A second later they cleared, revealing nothing left but a gnawed skeleton. The misshapen bones clattered to the floor, a humanoid reflection of what had happened to the serpent. To be honest, I was hoping our mutual friend would show up, Nain sighed, putting his hands on his hips as he inspected the art piece he'd created above. But that woman won't show her face when there's so many people around, especially important people. He waited for a reply, but none came. Cocking his head, he just continued to look up at Ruth Blaine, slowly, agonizingly slowly. She was trying to pull herself off the blade running her through. Goodness, Nine chuckled. You know what? I might actually keep you alive. It might be useful to have someone going after that woman, and I'm assuming you still do want revenge, right? It's just me you have a problem with for some reason? He reached his right hand out. Tendrils of black aether danced around the white hole as he pointed it up at Ruth. Of course, if I want you to run any real interference, I suppose I'll have to help you out, won't I? Nine chuckled. Don't worry. It won't hurt. You can ask the knight all about it when you're- He stopped talking. He blinked. He cocked his head. What? Nain said. With the cleanest of cuts, his right hand fell from his wrist. <gasps> Popcorn. Violet I ate for flirt. Serena sped past, her shield sword made visible only by the black blood that now covered it. Her own face was covered in cuts and scratches from where she charged through the forest of blades, but her eyes were resolute. 
pupils tiny, eyeballs bulging. This was the look of one who was prepared to kill. She drove her knee into the ground to stop her movement, kicking up sparks as she went. The, swords, the shield sword vanished, sending Nyan's ink-like blood splashing onto the floor, and she instantly manifested a new one to replace it. Hands off my friend! Sabrina cried. Nyan, Nyan looked from his severed hands to the blood on the floor, from the blood on the floor to Serena, all with what looked like an expression of genuine surprise on his face. Who are you? He asked, furrowing his brow. Serena extended a hand in Ruth's direction, purple aether coursing between her fingertips, and Ruth saw the telltale shimmering of the air in front of her. Bruno had erected a barrier to keep her safe. No, Ruth wanted to say. Don't protect me, you idiots. Run! Get away! Get out of here! But Serena did not run, or get away, or get out of there. She just opened her mouth and answered Nyan's question. Serena Del said, she snapped. I'm her friend! Nyan's reaction was immediate. He turned his body completely, facing Serena instead of Ruth. He clenched his good fist, and the black blood stopped flowing from his severed wrist. He narrowed his eyes, pupils glazed over with his tastes. Del said, he muttered, and the words were full of venom. He wasn't Ooh, smiling anymore. Lore! What could it be? <laughs> alright, well thank you all for watching. Let's see if we have any questions this week. I can't remember if we do. Mm, I think I think oh, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, MT2K21 asks, what are some of the best Aether Tick pools? Um, I would say Shepard has got like a six star fucking pool yeah, on her Aether Tick. It's not even like, because it, it, it's, it's one to one. If <laughs> It's not really a big, and it's time manipulation of your ability well. You can just fast forward your own aging to yeah. counteract it. So, it's not, there's no demerit yeah, it's only it, really. a benefit. It's, it's, it's so fucking brilliant. It, it might as well be I would also Aether argue Mira Loco has a bullshit one. That's just, like, unfair. Mm, that's a bit different, though, because that, that might... That can, cause the pain sure, but pain. he's, like, also able to keep fighting when he clearly should not be. Because it's... Like, he, like, he'll fucking get his hand, like, his arm, like, shredded, and he's just, like, going. It doesn't matter. And that makes all the difference. <laughs> it, it, it. Yeah, because he's also... A he's a, <laughs> sig a he is a Sigma male. <laughs> Um, Greeny asks, how many people graduated from the set, and how many of those graduates are still loyal to the UAP? Oh, wait, we already asked these, I think, because that was the uh, Catholic school comment, and I know we talked about lands. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. JT asks, do cogitants grow out of the baby stage faster than the other subspecies? In mentally? Um, I would say maybe there's a slight difference. They might go from, like, language skills, things like that might develop nice. a little bit faster. All right, and then we only have one other, so I'm going to save it for the next episode. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Okay. We shall see you next time. Bye! Bye!